Um, I, so I want to thank you all for coming today, on, particularly in our hot little project space here. It's the first time we've been able to have this kind of event in this space, so it's really exciting for us. So thank you so much. And I also want to uh, thank all. Oh, I want to thank all of our presenters, but I wanted to first introduce America, uh, America Meredith, who's been with us uh, and supported the Co Center all these years. She's one of the first people I met. I remember talking to you in my car in the parking lot here. I was a deer caught in headlights. I didn't know what I was doing, but she was very helpful. And so well, for working with her. No, we weren't smoking anything. And I think you probably all know America, but she's a Cherokee Nation and um, is an educator, author, artist, and independent curator whose curatorial practice spans three decades. She serves on the First Americans Museum, the Collections and Acquisitions Committee, and the Cherokee Arts and Humanities Council Board. Meredith taught early Native American art history at the Institute of American Indian Arts, Cherokee art history at the Cherokee Humanities class, and art history at Santa Fe Community College. She earned her MFA degree from the San Francisco Art Institute and her BFA from the University of Oklahoma. She managed them. What's your this name? Halavlina. Uh, Halavlina. Yeah, Halavlina Studios, uh, an alternative space in Santa Fe from 2009 to 2016. Um, and before I hand it over to her, I just want to let everyone know um, we're open. The first Friday of every month from 1 to 4, some of you have seen us and visit us then for tours of the collection. But we also strongly encourage you to call us for independent um, tours during the week. We love to give them, whether they're 30 minutes or 4 hours long. Um, <clears throat> and that way you can really visit with the collection and we can all learn from each other. And of course, I would be remiss as Executive Director if I didn't do a shout out to thank all of our donors, but also all of our future donors. So thank you all so much for coming today, and I will hand you over to America. Thank you all so much. I know this is like the busiest week of most of our lives, most of the year, so thank you for taking the time to hang out with us. And um, you know, um, I'm really grateful that everyone agreed to be here. We have coast-to-coast -coast representation, and of course, Curation, being an indigenous curator, many of you are indigenous curators in the audience. It's nothing new, um, but there's definitely a kind of a seed change and there's kind of a groundswell of new up and coming curators. So I, I see the changing things happen, so I really wanted to hear directly from the people that are agents of those change. So we're going to kind of go down the line with all the questions so that way we can be quicker and less gaps. But um, so at our far end, at the right end, is Melissa Shaganoff, um, who's Adna Athabaskan and also of Northern Paiute descent. She's an artist, a curator, and an auntie. Um, Melissa's completed residencies in Sweden, Italy, Canada, and Alaska, and she's also done work here. A lot of people, and she's curated a show that she can talk about that's here, open right now. Um, she's curated and juried art exhibitions with the Anchorage Museum, Alaska Pacific University, University of Alaska Anchorage, and the Coast Center, yay, and the International Folk Art Museum, the Fairbanks Art Association, and the Arctic Art Summit. And then, uh, sorry, it's out of order, I apologize. Tess Lukey is a Quinn and Wampanoag, so East Coast. Yes, there are tribes east of the Mississippi that still have their own land. And she's the Associate Curator of Native American Art for the Trustees of the Reservations in Massachusetts. She's also an artist. She's a ceramic artist and a basket maker. She's collaborated on and curated ex exhibitions with the Society of Arts and Crafts and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston the John Summers Gallery and Old Sturbridge Village, where that was your previous position, right? And then to my right is uh, Kaylin Frey Barnarski, who's a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and a descendant of the Muskogee Creek Nation. They are an assistant curator of Native Art at the Philbrick Museum of Art in Tulsa. They're also a musician, and actually you might be best known for your music, um, <laughs> and a visual artist who earned their MFA degree from the University of Arkansas, their MA degree, so two master's degree, from the University of Tulsa, and BFA from Rogers State College. And then to my left is uh, Rochelle B. Pablo, who is a citizen of the Navajo Nation, and curator, so not just an indigenous art curator, but just the curator, at 516 Arts in Albuquerque. 
Um, she curates exhibitions, develops programs, and works with community. She's coordinating an effort through 516 Arts, Indigenous Arts, and Latinx Arts programming statewide throughout New Mexico. Um, she's also a veteran in the U.S. Armed Services and holds an MA in Art History from the University of Delaware, a BFA from the IAI um, in Studio Arts, a mi and with a minor, anyway, in Studio Arts, a Certificate of Business and Entrepreneurship, and an Associate of Arts in Anthropology, and a Liberal Arts from Central New Mexico, <laughs> Central New Mexico Community College. So you have a very well-rounded, very eclectic background. And I would say, military, we don't see a lot of intersections, but with the artists, we do see a lot of intersections. So I think that's fantastic. And then to our far left is Nadia Jakinski Sethi. This is she's been here before at the Co, but this is her first Indian market. Yay! And she's a lieutenant, she's an art historian, she's a museum consultant, she's a writer, a program developer, she's based in Homer, Alaska. She's also a mom and also an advisor for First American Art Magazine. And she focuses her research on documenting Alaska Native Arts and supports Alaska Native Arts re revitalization programming through her position at the Surrey Foundation. And she's a contributor and regional representative of, as I just said, First American Art Magazine. So if you can give a round of applause for these wonderful people. And maybe, I mean, I know you guys are all brilliant and you come with your own um, education, but um, I just want to highlight that there has always been Native artists, you know, Native curators. So Angel Decora, who's Winnebago, she curated arts and crafts exhibitions, so they were arts exhibitions with Native and non-Native artists. Hopefully you know Arthur C. Parker, Seneca, um, Jenny Ross Cobbs, Cherokee Nation, born in 1881, and Louis Shotridge, who was a Clinket. So these are people working in museums. Native people have been in museums since there have been museums in this country. Um, so I just want to make that point. But um, things are changing, and one of the things that's changing is kind of the professionalism, that there's new programs for curatorial studies that honestly didn't exist 20 years ago. A lot of people came from anthropology or art history, so moving our one mic across, do you want to talk about kind of the professionalism, what you're seeing, and what programs helped you learn how to curate, starting with Melissa. Um, so I, I <laughs> I didn't really come from an academic background um, in museums or curation. I feel like I sort of happened upon it, you know, when I was an art student at the Institute of American Indian Arts, where I, I got the opportunity to travel to D.C. and do collections work. And I realized, um, I realized uh, the power that museums could, could hold if they were looked at as this, this sort of version of a library where I could look at objects, look at cultural belongings, and um, really bring them into my life and my work. And I decided that I wanted to do that with my community. Um, none of my family uh, and almost all of my Atma people hadn't gone to museums before I started working there, before I started working at a museum. At a museum. So I think part of the work that I did and what brought me into this sort of professionalism was this sort of desire really to just bring more um, people into collections and to um, give them the opportunity uh, that I had as well. Wani Kisak, Natasweis Taslukin, Tomas Akamahanat, hi, good morning. Um, I'm so glad to be here. I, honestly, the, the programs that have really changed my life have been ones that are both close to where I'm from but also much farther flung. I actually came out to UNM to get my master's degree because there was, it was honestly the only program that was like it at the time. Um, and they were really kind of in the beginning also of their museum studies program. I was there for art history but ended up spending a lot of my time and in fact getting a minor in museum studies while I was there. And that really opened up a lot of opportunities. In fact, being there, I spent a lot more time um, looking at fellowships and looking at internship opportunities that were available to me and available to all sorts of other people within the field, but in particular, the one that made the most difference in my life, and I know two other people in this panel have been through this fellowship program, but it was the one at the Peabody Essex Museum um, back in Salem, Massachusetts. They truly are doing some really amazing things for uh, indigenous people um, in the field and really offering up opportunities both for networking but uh, honestly support, um, constant support. And I'm so grateful for 
for them and to have them by my side um, and to constantly be there when I need a question answered or when I'm unsure about a decision I'm making. Um, and that's where all of these lovely ladies also come into play because they've become professionals in the field um, and are going to be a part of that support system as well. Hi, my name is Kaylin Faye Barnowski. I, some of you may know me as Kaylin Faye. That's okay. Barnowski is hard to spell, so <laughs> you can find me either way. Um, so I'm at the Philbrook Museum of Art. I'm the assistant curator of Native Art there, but I also have a focus in contemporary art. Um, how I got to where I am right now through programs, like Tess said, was through the Peabody Essex Museum. That was probably the most important um, Thing that I did to get me here now, but um, I come from a background of studio art and music. Um, I very much am about uh, multitudinal thinking and incorporating all these different parts to support the whole. So um, I have a music background, art background, and when I was in the middle of my second master's at University of Arkansas, um, I actually met Jamie Powell um, at an event at the TC Cannon exhibition. Um, that I had gone to to perform at, another way things intersect, which is crazy. Um, and I met Karen Kramer there, and she invited me to apply, and I did. And I actually didn't even do curatorial work while I was there. I did a little bit of it. Um, we were able to be a part of some certain processes, but I did integrated media while I was there. So I was building out all of these spaces for uh, the way people experience the work. And when I came back from that and was finishing my uh, MFA, I realized that so many people, so many Native people, so many artists coming from other backgrounds um, have to really overly explain the work that they're making. They have to validate the work that they're making and they shouldn't have to go through those processes. And I felt, um, I felt really inspired to start building out those spaces and finding the ways in which all these experiences intersect, the ways these different with making intersect, and um, but the key point for me was definitely the Peabody Essex Museum. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, she came to the dinner. She a Rochelle Pablo. You know shit. I am Red Running into the Water Clan, born for the Water Comes Together Clan, and um, my experience. Um, I would say it began with um, the Institute of American Indian Arts, and um, although my my um, main focus was in studio arts, uh, I did do the minor program with um, museum studies, and the museum studies program is phenomenal and exposed me to various um, activities and and. Um, I went to Oklahoma, I think it was 2018, and there was a symposium. And um, I was going to go for my master's in museum studies, and I had a conversation with Heather Otto, and um, she asked what I wanted to do. I told her, and she said, you need to go into art history. And um, by, that, by that time, I had, I had understood the power of the narrative, and um, I believe Kathleen Ash Milby was a keynote speaker during that symposium. And um, so I, as an artist, I had my individual voice, but I understood the curatorial had a um, broader reach and impact and the stories, the indigenous stories to be told from an indigenous perspective and experience. So, I ended up at Delaware in my art history. They have a curatorial track program for PhD, but I think I need to be out here working now. And um, but I also went to the um, the Pivity Essex Museum. I used to say Peabody, but they're like, no, it's Pivity. <laughs> okay, so the Penn Native American Fellowship Program, and um, that's um, by the Mellon Foundation. And that was also an amazing experience and exposed me to more editing and writing. And um, so I would um, say that is my experience up to this point. Tamai, Kriana Litnaluti, 
My name is Nadia Dickens from Think Tea again, and thank you so much for having us. It's really an honor to be here. I feel like a little bit of an imposter in the curatorial world, I must say, because my background is in art history and also archaeology a little bit, and I work in an Alaska Native nonprofit uh, called the Siri Foundation. So I feel like I have this opportunity to kind of infiltrate museums because I believe that museums are one of the spaces that are most powerful and most incredible because museums hold our most precious wealth. So material culture is one of our most incredible um, inheritance items, I would say. So at any opportunity that I can, I want to insert myself and my community into museum spaces to try to make space for us. I'm nervous, I don't know why. I get, I get nervous explaining what I do. But I, I want to make space to make sure that our stories are told with our own voices. I want to make sure that wherever our belongings are held, that those belongings know that we care and that we're there for them. So I'm very inspired by all of you sitting here. I'm very inspired. <laughs> I'm very inspired by many of the amazing programs that exist right now across North America and especially in Canada with the Inuit Futures Group, uh, with what uh, Julie Nagam and Heather Iwoliarte are doing by inspiring a new generation of curatorial work through the Indian Futures Collective in particular. Um, and I don't know what else I want to say right now, but um, I believe that museums such as the Smithsonian, especially the Arctic Studies Center, have been really instrumental in helping to bring along a new generation of indigenous curators. So I'd like to give a shout out to Don Bittison in particular, who is somebody that puts uh, younger generations of artists and curators under her wing, but also uh, the Bill Home Center, and particularly Robert Wright, who was one of my mentors as a graduate student at the University of Washington. So it's a great pleasure to be here today, and I'll try to talk a little bit louder. <laughs> <laughs> Demonstrating how to speak loudly. But, um, so curation, we often think of art curation in a museum, but um, there are so many different tracks in museums. I guess museums are the best documented and they're institutional, but in the art world there's, you know, every alternative space, there's street arts, there's, you know, uh, art fairs. But I'm curious, like, how you would, just to backtrack, how you would define curation, what you do, and then also kind of what are the unseen aspects of curation that the public might not be always aware of? Hmm. Um, so, you know, I would say that uh, the curation is essentially storytelling, um, that it is, you know, spending time you know, with artists, with work, with their cultural belongings, and, and trying to tell the most truthful story of those things and of those people. Um, and I think, too, that curation, when we think about it and break it down to like its skeleton, you know, at its core, it is. It is like a very indigenous way of being, you know. I think about the way that, you know, you make some beadwork and um, it's your first it's your first piece, so you have to give it away to somebody. And in giving it away, you have to talk about your teachers, you have to talk about who was part of that, you know, who was part of your journey of creating that. And I think that curation is essentially is essentially that. And um, at least the work that I do, that's what I try to bring into the story is telling as much of the story as you can, the whole story, you know. Um, it's not just about this finished product, you know, this art piece. Um, I think indigenous arts, and, and I, I guess a big part of why we all do what we do, um, you know, is created out of like great love and a great respect for the materials of which it's made from. Um, and, I, and I also think too that it's, uh, it's, it's the way we, we keep each other strong and support each other and create cooperation in communities. And not that other cultures don't do that, but when you bring in institutions, when you bring in capitalism, you bring in the money, it, it, can, it can divert the sort of purpose of why we create things. And, and that's why I think indigenous curation is, is really important for the world. <laughs> You know, not just us, you know, within indigenous artists, it's important for all of us to see those things. Um, did I answer the question? <laughs> okay. Um, is 
this work better? It's louder? Yeah. Definitely. I can also be loud without a mic, so, you know, <laughs> <laughs> EP. Um, <laughs> um, curation for me is uh, a really important part of my life. I mean, my mom and dad would tell you that I've curated everything in their house, and I curate everything in my own house. Um, I've been doing it since I was little. They used to say I loved to organize chaos because it was like a museum exhibit, so in my, on my desk would look very particular, and I'm still that, that way. Um, so I've been curating since I was really young, um, since I was a young, young kid. And so it's been kind of obvious for me to go into this field and be a part of this field. Um, I come from Massachusetts. Um, you know, America's common about, yes, there are tribes uh, east of the Mississippi. Yeah, we're here, we're still alive. And the thing is, is that comment comes from um, some really per terrible perpetuated stereotypes and stories about our people being long erased. Well, we're still here. We still got land out on Aquina. You know, I still go to Powwow every year. If you come out, it's on September 9th. Come out and see us. Um, like, it's, we're still there. And that story is often missing from Massachusetts narratives, from New England narratives. Um, people don't realize that we are living, breathing cultures that are still thriving despite um, the East Coast being a center, a huge center of colonialism um, and erasure. And so being a curator in that area is really important to me to continue to tell the stories of my people and the people around me. Um, because we are missing from those narratives a lot of the time. I also work for an organization that's not necessarily your obvious organization for doing curating in. I work for a land conservation organization. The Trustees of the Reservations own, owns over 130 different properties across Massachusetts, and most of that is land. Um, and so as a curator, I'm not only curating things that you think of in the museum, but I'm also curating things outside those four walls. Um, I'm doing works with artists like Rose V. Simpson um, to bring real visibility on the actual land. I'm working in collaboration with tribal communities that are there to bring art pieces that really touch um, on the places that we call home and that we hold dear. And so the work that I do is not just within those four walls of that institution, but much larger and driven by access uh, as a big, big thing um, and representation and visibility. Wow, I'm so impressed by everybody. <laughs> I'll just listen to you guys talk. Um, so, this one is an interesting question because I think about this a lot, but something that I learned from my, one of my mentors, someone I didn't mention while I was talking about how I got here, was before I started as assistant curator, I was actually a fellow through the Mellon Foundation under Christina Burke. And Christina Burke is an incredible curator. I'm sure you all have heard of her, but something that was really embedded within me when we were working really closely together was that our role is not as a purveyor of knowledge, but we are facilitators of knowledge. We include community, it's communal knowledge that we're sharing. Um, and that includes bringing people into the museum and going to visit them. Um, so I think something that people don't always think about when we think about this idea of a curator is that you know, they're so high up in this system, and you know, like they're untouchable, you know, it's weird. That's how I always thought about them, but really it's a, you're in almost like a servant role. You're here to help bring those stories and platform, platform them in a way and tell the story and give autonomy back to the community. Um, and again, that includes bringing people in. Something she taught me was always bringing people in, always being open to having people come visit the collection, having people come visit the collection to pray, to be with the objects, um, that they can touch the objects. You know, there's a lot of institutions that don't want their objects touched because we have oils in our hands and, you know, uh, degrading the material. But it's important that these objects are thought of as alive and that they need to be cared for. Um, in a specific way, and that needs to be with community. So something I think that's important to me is just being a facilitator of knowledge, being a facilitator of those experiences. Curation to me. Um, I, I came into the curatorial role um, from an art, artist perspective or experience, and um, I... I was very intentional when I came into curatorialship and um, just um, ensuring, I feel it's a great responsibility to be a curator, um, to ensure and make sure the artists are protected 
and that their authentic voices are being heard and not distorted or, or um, manipulated out of the context of how these works were made. And um, so, I, uh, while I was in um, grad school, um, I noticed there was a shift that I was a part of like um, uh, a larger scale of um, indigenous um, cur curators. And um, for me, it was after the No Dapple in 2016, um, seeing the absence of um, the narrative of the stories being told. But social media really um, empowered and gave voice to the narrative and to the, to the indigenous people and to the indigenous stories. So I, I was thinking about going to MFA school um, in the arts, and that changed the whole trajectory of my, my where I am today. And um, I feel it's a sacred position because I, um, there's so many erased voices. And um, I feel as a curator, I, I seek the unheard, you know, and I, I, I mean no disrespect, but there's a term that's used often within the field. It's called the usual suspects. And um, I, I try to um, reach and find the voices that aren't heard. And, um, and then um, create the narratives. And, um, and um, I, I always um, seek counsel, you know, whether it's America, um, or other respected um, scholars and mentors with who are in the field. And um, because I'm fairly new, I just began my position um, in May of last year. So I feel I'm barely at the beginning of this journey. And, um, but um, I, I feel it's also a form of activism, you know, and um, I, I think of, um, you know, an artist, indigenous artist, performing artist, oh gosh, my, my brain just dropped, um, from San Diego area. Um, but anyway, he was like, you need to be smart. You need to be really intelligent that you can't just have an angry voice and where someone could come around the corner and, um, and just scare them away. You need to lure them in. And when they're right there, then the truth will be revealed. And um, so that's what I feel curation is. I feel it's an art form in itself. And um, I, I see um, Mr. Joseph Sanchez here, who's, who's respected curator and also an amazing artist. So these are the um, um, people that I've looked up to. And um, so that's, that's my answer. <laughs> I believe curation is a lot about holding space and just creating space. When you are working as a curator, you're not only collecting and you're not only connecting with your community, you are making sure that we have a space to be safe, to tell our stories in a real and authentic way. And I'd like to make sure we point out too that curation is not just something that happens in a museum. It's something that can happen in our community. It happens when we are building workshops for communities. It happens when we are going into schools with artists and developing arts programs there. It happens, it can happen anywhere. Melissa and I are part of a program that's called Alaska Native Museum Sovereignty. And with this program, we have a really special opportunity um, for the next nine years where we're going to be working on a, see, I think a, the title is Circumpolar Indigenous Sovereignties, and we have a little bit of funding to be able to experiment with the idea of what is indigenous curation and what will it look like if we take curation outside of museum walls. So we're thinking about how could we take the concept of curation and take it to, say, a glacier or to a moose hide tanning camp, and what, what will that look like? Bringing the 
it up. Um, we just all missed it, unless y'all went. But um, August 12th, um, outside of Nuke, on a um, on a um, glacier, they have that annual music and art festival. It's totally free and family free. So maybe next year, next August, let's all go to Nuke instead in Greenland. But um, one question, and it might seem obvious, but really, why do institutions need indigenous curators? I mean, it's much more than checking a box. Starting these questions was a little bit. <laughs> um, thanks. Uh, you know, oh gosh, this is such a huge question because I think I question myself, you know, a lot of the time. You know, when I was working for an institution, and then when most recently when I guest curated at the International Folk Art Museum, and I think that I through that work I did with Laura Addison and Susie Jones, I feel like I, I really did sort of suss out what my value is in those things. And I think that um, indigenous curation, we bring our whole community with us. You know, it's every person who's part of that exhibit is my friend, is, you know, like my best friend growing up, you know, is you know, relatives. And, and I think that um, they were able to bring this perspective of let's tell a story where indigenous people, an indigenous audience, is the center of the world. You know, and that we're gonna tell a story that speaks to them. And in doing that, we're gonna teach the whole world, we're gonna teach our whole communities about who we are. You know, because I think that a lot of times what I would hear um, when I was working for an institution was that well, we, we have to change the language so, you know, so our audience can understand it. And what they were really saying was, so a white, white audience can understand it. And I think that when, when, we, when we decide to sort of center, you know, the conversation and the, and the information from an indigenous perspective, particularly when it's indigenous artworks, indigenous pieces, we need to give our audience more credit. <laughs> because I think that we're all human and we recognize each other and even if even if it's something that feels like a nuanced insider kind of language it's something that we can learn from each other you know and i, and I think we have to you know, just continue to to do that to look at our projects and our, our exhibits and you know all those things is you know what what does that indigenous person think about when they're viewing these things and does it speak to them and I, I want to echo some things that you've said. I mean, it's it's truly an honor for me in particular to be working in my homeland um, regularly, um, actually in concert with the land, touching it almost every day. Um, because I lacked that in a lot of my work prior to where I am now. I honestly, I took a break from curatorial because I was big time questioning myself. I didn't know whether the field was for me, whether they wanted me. Um, and I took a moment to heal, and in that I found my reconnection with the land and the place that I um, come from and the place I was situated, and that was really important to me. Um, now, working for the, con the land conservation organization that I do, my curatorial background and then my background both as a gardener um, and in horticulture is coming in together in this beautiful way. Um, Part of the trustees is also two small museums. One of them is a contemporary art museum and sculpture park, and one is a kind of small, historically-based museum. And between the two of them, I've been able to really suss out new stories um, and bring in better representation of local community members. I work in collaboration with my community and various New England communities on an almost daily basis. And because of that, those stories are being told. We're not being forgotten anymore. And we're recentering the narrative on Native peoples in New England. And especially at a place where land is at the center of all of that, I think it's really critical that Native stories, Native frameworks, Native belief systems are first and foremost. And the other thing I wanted to say is that as a Native curator, um, in a place where they never had one, they created the job for me. It was something that never existed in this organization prior to my arrival 10 months ago. I just started there. Um, it, it feels really amazing to bring Native presence and 
people and belief systems back to the art that's within their organization. I walk into collections every time I do and I greet the works that are there. I remind them that I'm here and that I'm going to support them and that their people will be with them at some point in their lifetimes again. And I think that that also is what is really important to bring to organizations is that kind of thought processes because the more that we do, the more it becomes a part of everyone else's every day and the more that we are centered and the more that our voices are as important as everyone else's. I'd just like to echo what everyone's already said. <laughs> but I think it's important for us to be in these spaces. Uh, I mean, specifically because I think other Native artists feel safe when they find us in those spaces. We're able to speak to something differently. We're able to understand community in a different way with them. But I also think centering that narrative is so important. And our way of thinking is so vastly different than the Western way of thinking of the world and looking at art even. Um, artist uh, Molly Murphy Adams um, came to visit an object. It was a cradle board that we have in the museum collection. And when we talked, we had this really extensive conversation about you know, art and how we experience it and the importance of seeing something in the round. Because uh, for like paintings or a lot of Western art, you can experience it, you can understand it as a whole in a single glance. But for Native art, you have to experience all parts of it. So that means you have to redirect your body, you have to move around it, you have to touch it, you have to feel it. Um, and it's experiencing all the parts that helps you understand the whole. And I think a lot of Western uh, curators and a lot of museums don't always understand that perspective that we have to have many parts to build the whole. Um, and that's uh, in the way, not just that we curate Native art specifically, but how we curate art altogether. So something I'm tasked with at the museum is curating contemporary art, is bringing in our African collection, our Asian collection. Um, and all of these stories can intersect if we do think about it within the frameworks of um, indigenous art. Um, so I think it is just centering that narrative and that way of thinking that helps people build bridges with each other and I think brings a lot of people together. Thank you. And perhaps you want to also discuss why it's not only important to have indigenous curators, but also indigenous art represented as well? That was my question to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I'll, um, um, yeah, I, I feel like um, institutions, why it's important with indigenous curators is um, um, what has already been said is there's a distinct perspective and insight. Um, I know for myself that um, comes into the space and just engaging with community. I'm not saying it's only us. I'm, I'm just saying there's a certain way. It's more engagement and um, and it was brought up when I was um, taking a course last year with Bess Murphy, and um, we, there was um, a set of rules by um, um, SAR and IARC, and it has with community, and I've really, that has really resonated with um, this um, way to bring in or, or engage with elders our communities and um, interspaces. Um, there's this kind of, um, I, I know there, for me, there's a certain way, like, it's not just transactional, like, oh, here's your honorarium and okay, bye. You know, it's, it's more like engaging and acknowledging. And um, um, I think with indigenous curators, besides all the skills and bringing a show together, there's a certain way that's this um, way of engaging. And, um, and um, I, um, with the native art, um, the native art, I just feel, you know, um, one of my mentors is non-native and is um, Ryan Flayhive, who's the archivist at IAIA. And I just love going to the space and we just kick back on that barber chair and he's like, talk to me, Pablo. And um, so, 
you know, we get in these really um, energized dialogues, and I just am like euphoric by the time I leave because it's just creative. And, um, you know, um, Native art, and um, although we may not have called it Native art or art back then, um, just creating is that, you know, I'll quote, he's like, Rochelle, Native art is American art. It predated all of these little factions, and that's how I see it, and that's why I feel um, we need to, I mean, that's a given. That, I mean, that's my thought, and that's how my brain works, because before colonization, this is, you know, our space, Turtle Island, and um, so, I, I think it's really important. It, um, where I work is a non-collecting museum. So, so I, since I've been on board with the um, support of a Henry Luce Foundation, boy, we've sprinkled in some indigeneity, and it's beautiful. <laughs> it is so beautiful. And as a result, the visitors that have been coming are a lot higher presence of indigenous and Latinx people. And um, so I, I'm just, and to me, that's a true reflection of the society of Albuquerque. And it matches, and it's just not a certain hierarchy that I used to see in museums. But it, it, it just, you know, I not to be morbid, but I'm just like, I could die today, not that I want to die, but I, I, I would be content because I feel like I am fulfilling the prayer and um, that's, that's all I have. When I go into a space with other indigenous people in a museum, to me, I feel this incredible kind of vibrancy, um, especially in collection storage areas where you get a sense that the things that are there are really part of our families, and I think that is unique for Indigenous peoples. I used to work at the Shelton Jackson Museum in Sitka, which is part of the Clinkett community, and one of the most incredible things was uh, weavers would just stop by to come visit the collections, and one of the weavers who did regularly was Terry Rothgar. Um, she's no longer with us, but when Terry would come in, she would open up our basketry case and she'd be like, oh, hello girls, how are you today? So nice to see you. And she just had this beautiful dialogue with these baskets that are part of her extended family. And you know, they're still part of our family. Our material culture holds all of our stories, but it also holds part of our DNA. And so we consider them like our kin and definitely not just, not just things that are sitting there, but they are part of our family. So indigenous curators open up that space uh, for really making museums living places for, for I don't know, connecting us past, present, and future. I think indigenous curation also makes it very comfortable to go into a space with your babies and your grandparents, and that doesn't always happen in museums. Uh, so something else that was special about working for the Sheldon Jackson Museum, I was a very young mom at the time, and I brought my baby with me, and she, she's, she hung out, she worked in the collections with me, and that was allowed. Um, and I, I think I helped make that space for other people to bring their children in and feel welcomed too. But sometimes you get, if you're a mom, sometimes you are kicked out of museum spaces or they say your baby shouldn't be here crying. Um, but babies need to be in those spaces and they need to smell the smells and touch the, everything and just be part of that. So in indigenous curation, we are intergenerational. We bring our families with us, I think. I think that's part of the root of it. And I loved what you were saying about being part of, you know, like that experience of knowing your land and experiencing that daily and bringing those beliefs with you in the work that you do. So that's absolutely part of it. Um, indigenous people, we have our own aesthetic systems and our own, our own ways of valuing everything. And we bring that with us in the work that we do everywhere. And then, I know we are kind of running a little, perhaps, but can we take some audience questions? Do any of you have questions? And I might have to repeat it back so we can hear it. Someone has a question. Yes, in the yes. back. Hi. I have a question. So, um, how, uh, how would you all handle, you know, a lot is happening right now, right? Like, a lot's coming out about 
what people are doing, what they have done, maybe negative things that people wish weren't out there in the world now, um, but you know, a fuller version of that person, and it's happening, you know, with all artists. So, um, what would you do, you know, if there's a situation and you have to make a decision on um, curating someone's work who, you know, recently or a long time ago that things have come out about, but the, but the work is still quality work. There's, you know, there's nothing wrong with the work, but the ethics are a question. That's the new word I'm looking for. How, how do you okay. grapple with that? So you're asking when someone, something horrible comes out out of a person's actions, how do you deal with the artwork? So do you guys, instead of going down the line, does anyone want to raise their hand and deal with that? I have an example that probably, I don't know that I should bring it, but. Um, <laughs> I work for an institution that had some issues. Um, with that exactly, I imagine you're also talking about identity issues. Um, and at first, honestly, I didn't take the job that I'm in because of that. And they went through the whole round of hiring, you know, going ready to hire someone, and they were going to hire them, and then they realized that, like, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense for us to be hiring someone who's not from community in this position after we've had all of these issues with identity-related um, problems and people taking space. Um, and in a place, especially in New England, where um, that's really, really hard. Um, really, really visible. And I know I keep echoing that, but it really is um, a lot of my reality on a daily basis. Um, when I work, especially with the public, um, at Fruitlands Museum in Harvard, Mass, because it has a very long history um, of not really representing Native people in, in the best light. But I didn't, I didn't take that job initially. And I had a mentor say to me, what are you doing? What are you doing? You have the chance to actually make some change. You have a chance to change these people's minds. You have a chance to change the institution's mind. You have a chance to be visible and be present. And you are hungry for this job. Why aren't you taking it? And I said, I'm afraid. And she said, you never let fear held you back before, so why are you letting it hold you back now? And so I applied, and I interviewed, and I interviewed, and I got the job. And now I have no bad days. I have amazing colleagues who are willing to listen to me. I have a support system like I have never experienced before. And I realize that that's not always possible in museums. And maybe that's why the Land Conservation Organization is so perfect for where I am, because it is both museum and it is both um, environment and it's people and it's places and it's all these things that come together. And if I hadn't just taken the chance to be like, okay, I realize they made some serious mistakes here um, and gone, okay, but, but what if we can change that? If I hadn't really reoriented my own thinking about this and instead of sitting there criticizing, I, I wouldn't have the job I'm in. Um, and I wouldn't have the chance to share with all of you the things that I do and be a part of this amazing group of people here on this panel. That one is a really difficult question. I will say that much. <laughs> uh, I am going to continue saying this, that I think people are a holistic whole. And from my understanding, from my cultural understanding, is that we embed our stories into our material culture um, and our knowledge is into that. And that means those things as well. And so I don't want to put those things on view. Um, I'm not going to platform that type of work or that person because what I think that someone like that might need is actually prayer and ceremony and community in those moments and not a platform to share their work. You know, I think that um, we're past the time of separating you know, or trying to separate the art from the artist, you know, because we're, we're telling, you know, a story, and if we're working towards equity within institutions and museums, then we need to also support a safe space for people coming in and seeing those things, you know. Um, that being said, I do believe that, like, the process of, of change and healing is a, is a, is a never-ending circle, meaning that you always need to be asking the question of how you can do better, you know, and 
I think too that it, also if a decision like that is be, trying to be made by one or two or three people, there's not enough people in the conversation. You know, um, I think that like the communities need to be involved, you know, the appropriate person. And you know, I can't tell you who that is, right? It's all depending on the situation. But I think that like if you're trying to create healing and also be cautious about people's safety and um, and feelings within your institution, then there needs to be just some discussion you know, and some some work and work towards healing and, and prayer and those things. Um, but I think we have to also think of all the audience that is coming in and viewing those things and, and how that could be triggering because you know, as we all know, historically museums have not been a safe space for indigenous people. So we need to be working to make those as safe as possible. Are there other questions? Oh, we do have an answer. Um, currently at 516 Arts in Albuquerque, um, although I haven't um, um, scheduled a meeting for the past few months, um, we do have an Indigenous Advisory Council, and I feel that would be a specific um, situation where I wouldn't make be the sole um, decision maker. And um, the advisory council, there's um, five um, indigenous artists and creators and scholars. Um, some part of that and, and um, that certain situations have brought up. Um, and um, we, have a, we have a dialogue about it. And um, I feel that that's how it is addressed. Um, so far. So any questions? Mm -hmm. All good. So if you haven't yet, there is, um, at the Cozumel building is Looking Again, which is curated by a modest indigenous curator, Alex uh, Pena, the deputy director here. Thank you so much, and um, thanks also to Rachel and the uh, co. And I want to hand it over to Melissa because she has an event happening and a show she curated right after this. So we're going to get the bus together. Yeah. So we might have a full house, <laughs> but um, I, I would love to invite you all this weekend, you know, and to also think about coming to the International Folk Art Museum and viewing. Um, hun, huna, huna naktika. I'm, I'm not saying it right. St. Lawrence Island Olympic, but it means to keep them warm, and it's an exhibit of 20 Alaska Native parkas um, and the surrounding things about parka making and the story and the love, and of course, um, contemporary parka makers as well. So I'd, I'd love to invite you all to come to that. It was curated by my guest curator, Susie Jones, and Laura Addison here. and. Um, it, it, it's deeply affected me, and me, <laughs> uh, but it, it's deeply affected me, that work, and I, I truly appreciate you both. Many times I can say the public, I'm going to it. <laughs> so please come, um, see the exhibit, and uh, yeah, visit with us. <laughs>